Productive Pastor 80, Prepping to Preach. What's going on, friends? Episode 80 of the podcast. I'm a little set back with, man, 80 episodes down, y'all. This has been a lot of fun this time around, but I hope I'm finding you well. Hope your week is going well. Uh, I hope you're getting ready for Thanksgiving because that's coming up next week. We're not going to have an episode of the podcast, by the way. But, man, it's just this year is going so fast. And for the rest of the year, what I want to focus in on is how we can develop a handful of critical things to help us see things bigger, to help us see things over the year, to help us understand what it means to be more intentional with some of the basic practices of ministry productivity. And this episode today is about prepping to preach. I'm talking about how you would create sermon preparation systems. And we're going to get more into that later on. But just before we jump into stuff, let's you know about a couple of quick things. One, if you're looking at exploring individual one-on-one coaching before the year is over, I'd love for you just to reach out. There's a link in the show notes to how you can do that. You can schedule a free 30-minute exploratory call Get out some more information about what does it mean for us to work together uh, in a coaching relationship next year. I let folks know about this at the end of the year because a lot of times what a lot of folks want to do is kind of split things between their 2023 ministry expenses and their 2024 expenses. This is something we can definitely do, but I love working one-on-one with pastors. I love helping them, but I also learn so much in the conversations I have with them about their own productivity and ministry, and just the walls they want to get over. So if that sounds interesting to you, make sure you click that link in the show notes about personal one-on-one coaching. But let's just go straight into our content today, prepping to preach. So let me ask you this question. How do you prepare and work on sermons in a more efficient way? That's the larger conversation I want to have today. But this is what I mean. Over the last few episodes, we've been talking about bits and pieces of this. You know, a couple episodes back, I shared about, you know, the three different types of ministry weeks, and folks had a lot of questions about, you know, how does the sermon fit into this? There's been some uh, fun conversation going on over on Twitter or X or whatever you call it right now about that sort of a thing, but but how do you handle these sorts of things? And I also sent out a tweet um, about this kind of the basic stuff. This is that bare minimum productivity I talked about in that episode, um, but it's your time for your sermon work, but I also talked about a handful of specific times of deep work. Now, we also talked about task layers a few more episodes back and understanding what does it mean uh, to to divide our tasks, to divide our ministry, uh, our, our to-do list and our strategy, all that sort of things into these times where we know like, we're at our best or we're, you know, where we're okay or where we're not really doing that well and we're doing something, we need to be doing things that don't require too much mental energy or fortitude inside of that. Some of that goes back super early on with uh, content out of the Becoming Productive course, with the draining, dealing, and designing ideas. But, you know, sermon work falls into all of those things. And and we have to think strategically about how we're prepping and where we're prepping and when we're prepping. And one of the things that I think is an absolute constant in ministry, especially if you're a, a solo pastor, is the sermon. The sermon has to get done. And most of us, we want our sermons to be good And for some reason, this sermon, the thing that's the most important thing in some ways that we do in ministry, it's the thing that gets shoved to the margins more often than not. I believe, and kind of a core uh, inner assumption of mine, I guess, is the sermon should be one of the most important things, if not the most important thing that you're working on each week. But for some reason, we always put it off. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I've got about half of my coaching relationships or people processing through that idea of how to make the margin for their sermon preparation for them and what that looks like. So how long does your sermon take? When I first started in ministry, you know, sermons took me 20 plus hours. And there, there, it took 20 plus hours for a reason. I wasn't that experienced in writing sermons. I wasn't that experienced in preparing sermons. And there's a difference, I think, between preparing and writing. I'm going to talk about that in this episode. But I was also trying to, I was still experimenting and wanting to know how I did all of those things and how I do do them in a big way. But the biggest thing was probably this. I wasn't that experienced with communication design. 
And that's one of the, mo- the biggest priorities I really have in my own preaching is understanding how am I communicating all of this? It's not just information regurgitation or that sort of a thing. So I'm always thinking about communication design. And especially as my ministry context has changed and shifted so much over the last 15 years or so since I've been preaching fairly regularly, if not weekly, uh, communication design always changes. That's the thing I spend a lot of my own focus on. So in this episode, what I want to talk about is how we can be as efficient as possible with our sermon preparation, and not just to save time, but also for us to be as responsive as possible. So when we have those different weeks, as I called them a couple episodes back, our sermon preparation time doesn't fail miserably. That We're still able to do this uh, with a level of, of health and with a level of co- uh, competency and with just to still preach good sermons, even if we don't have as much time uh, to do that so. And the reason, the way I do this, the way the how behind this, I really feel like it's we have to build up a rhythm where we know how to preach. Like we know how to do the things that we need to do. And the time will get easier uh, because we will learn things. We'll learn things about ourselves. We'll learn things about our preparation process. We will learn things about the resources and tools we have access to. We're going to learn how to streamline it, not to waste energy necessarily. You know, sometimes for me, this means I've got certain commentaries or resources I always lead with first, and that changes from book to book or from sermon idea to sermon idea, but that I know there's certain things I'm going to go to first, and there's other things I'm not going to go to unless I'm either stuck or I have an inordinate amount of time on my hands. But it also means learning the other things that help us out, and that's kind of some of this I want to share today. And so I call this prepping to preach. And where this comes from is when I was in college, I got a job uh, at a closed circuit television station on the campus of Louisiana Tech University. And we would make like silly little videos and do the news. Uh, like half of what we do is just a rip off of whatever MTV was doing at that time and just making it for our college campus. But I also, I got assigned to be the person to shoot um, uh, not advertising videos, but like, after home football games, they want to have a little three-minute video set to music or whatever, and I got tasked with that. That was actually the first thing they had new videographers going out and doing, and, and we learned in that in that place to do what was called shoot to edit, and rather than going out and doing something and having several hours of footage available to you in order to make a two-minute video, we learned to do a little bit of scripting, and this is not, people weren't even talking in these videos. This is literally just like a sequence of cool shots, let's be honest. We learned to do some scripting. We learned to figure out what shots we wanted. We learned how long those shots needed to be. And we also learned that there's always an extra bit of footage that works well no matter what. Uh, And sometimes that meant like getting shots of other football games that we know, hey, no matter what, I can slide this in there. It's going to look good. And so rather than having a couple of hours of footage to get our two or three minute clip, we had 10 to 12 minutes of footage in order to get our two minute clip. We were shooting to edit. We were shooting with the edit in mind. And prepping to preach is the exact same thing. Our preparation process is not this complete, exhaustive investigation into a text. Like we're writing, um, I think I had to write like a 25-page exegesis paper on 10 verses in the book of Joshua in seminary. Like We're not going that deep. You're not writing a commentary here. You're not teaching an hour-long lecture on the passage. You're preaching a sermon. And depending on your tradition and your church and all the other things, you know, you might be talking for 15 minutes, you might be talking for 45 minutes, but you are, it's a sermon. Like that's the purpose of it. It's it's supposed to be a sermon and the way that we prepare is designed to be the output delivery of what's happening, which is the sermon. I mean, so many times I'm working with folks that are struggling with it. Uh, They do so much extra preparation work because they think that means they're being faithful to text. And yes, they might be being faithful to the text in that scenario, but they're probably not being as faithful to the sermon and they're not being as faithful with their time as possible. So let's get into this conversation about prepping to preach and the things I've learned over the last, you know, 15 years. Uh, And and this is not, I mean, this is what works for me. Uh, you might find things in this that work well for you. You might find things you say, Chad, I got some beef with you. you want to take it up? Well, I don't know if this is cool with me. So, all right. The number one thing is this. This is what you have to discern. You have to figure out at first. What are the elements in your preparation? I worked with a pastor when I was under my first appointment as a Methodist pastor. So my first full-time as a pastor job, for those of you outside of Methodist world. And um, I was preaching weekly in our contemporary service, and our senior pastor was preaching weekly in our traditional service. And this is what his sermon preparation rhythm looked like. 
he would come to the office on Monday morning and would write the first sentence of his introduction for this next Sunday's sermon. And he was done with his sermon when he wrote out the last sentence of his closing prayer of his sermon. Like homeboy went completely linearly in a linear fashion. Can we say that word in a linear fashion and straight to find your manuscript. That's how he wrote sermons. And I remember thinking this is a little bit odd and it seems to be a little bit difficult. So I don't suggest that strategy, but if I'm going to be honest with you, if you ask a random person, how do you write a sermon? They might think that's how it happens. But do this. Think over the course of a couple of weeks, what do you normally do? What is the first thing you do? What is the second thing you do? What is the third thing you do? Henceforth, like that. Uh, Do you have specific phases of your preparation or stages? I talk to some people And they'll do like their intro from a big to a medium to a little view. And then they'll do one section at the big level, the medium level, and then the little level. Like kind of they they slowly get more and more detailed as it goes out. Uh, All that sort of thing. Do you have specific phases or stages? And this is what I do. Now, I think this is what works for me. And when I'm working with folks that have like all sorts of problems with their Sherman systems, this is what I kind of suggest for at least us to start off with. Uh, but is this, I like to go from big to little across the whole sermon at once. And so I know that I've got my phase one is I'm reading the passage uh, typically 10 to 15 times. I'm asking a bunch of questions. I might taking some observations. Uh, I'm taking a really big view in a very casual way. That might be the best way to put it. I'm going to be, if I had to attach a word to this part of the process, I'm just going to be curious for as long as I feel like is necessary. And then what I go into is kind of the research phase. And what that means is all those questions I might have asked, I'm going to go try to answer those questions. Um, I usually do that first with word studies or thematic studies. Like I go into the IVP dictionary of like Jesus and the Gospels, the IVP uh, dictionary of uh, biblical imagery, those sorts of things, or the Anchor Bible dictionary. Like I'm going to go and I'm going to research these ideas or these words that I think matter. And then after that, that's when I go into commentary reading, or if I'm part of a series where I've done some extra deep level work into, um, I'm going to go through, because I've typically read those books by then, and I've left notes inside of there. Um, I've got highlights in Readwise, that sort of a thing. I'm, I'm not going to that stuff just yet, unless I've already identified it being kind of key and crucial to it. That's when I'm going to commentaries. And like I said, I mean, I've got a lot of commentaries, y'all. But I've learned which, for most, for the most part, there's still a handful of parts of the Bible and certain books. I've not figured this out yet, but I know what my go-to number one commentary for most things is going to be. And I'm typically going to try to read three commentaries uh, on it, but I'm also not reading it necessarily from like section to section. Remember, I'm, I'm coming in here to answer questions and to figure things out. I do realize that sometimes as part of that commentary reading, I will see new things that I've not thought about before, but by the time I get to the commentaries, I've got a trajectory and a pathway that I'm already working on. Remember, preach, I'm, prepared, I'm prepping to preach. And then the last thing I do is that's when I outline, I manuscript, I do my communication design, all those sorts of things. And so over the years, I've realized, okay, I've kind of got four moves in my sermon preparation, and I prefer to do it holistically. So the whole sermon at a big level, then the whole sermon at a little bit deeper of a level, then the whole sermon at a super deep level, and then I call that the whole research phase is done there. So the second step is once you've defined these elements is figuring out how can I divide these elements. And and some what you might want to be thinking about is think about your energies, think about your task layers, think about that sort of a thing. Like what needs to work when and how? Because there are parts of my preparation that can be done really quick. There's parts of my preparation can be done when I might be in a yellow zone or in a dealing space. We can talk about task layers, the kind of things that I can do at the in the middle of an afternoon when my mind might not be at its best, but I'm not drained absolutely. Um, there are certain things I can do then. You might want to call that shallow work if you're a big Cal Newport fan. You know, I can read the text and ask questions and make reflections and that kind of stuff. When my mind is kind of tired, I can read. So I can do a lot of my researching and that stuff when my mind is tired. 
What I also know is where the deep work comes into play really is in one space primarily, and that's when I'm doing my outlining and my communication design. That's where I need to be at my best. And for me, I can take care of that. I need one of those blocks a week. I like to have two deep work blocks a week, and one of those needs to be devoted to the sermon because I have learned through this strategy, there's really only one time where I need a few hours of absolutely focused, undivided attention to my sermon. So think about this. How can you divide these elements? You know, you think through the the elements you've identified and in, in level one, and then think about where does your energy level and stuff need to be. This isn't giving you an excuse to context switch, because trust me, context switching is never good for anybody. But what it does let you do is realize these are when I can put time throughout my week as part of this. Now, I've worked with folks before that will say, I'm going to do all of my message preparation on Tuesday. And they literally start on Tuesday morning and they start their sermon from scratch. And then when they're done on Tuesdays, the sermon manuscript is written and done. I applaud you for multiple reasons, but I can't do that. I don't work that way. And if you're one of those folks, that's totally cool. I think that's awesome. Um, but I can't, and I know a lot of folks that listen, they struggle to find, you know, seven to eight hours of uninterrupted time. I'm thinking about the pastor that is going to have to be kind of all over the place through the week. It might be the bivocational person like me that spends, you know, two days a week on the road and and can't get to this necessarily. Uh, but like I said, I'm not advocating context switching, but what I am advocating is you being aware of the time in the day and the energy and where your brain is at and thinking through how you can stack your sermon preparation as part of that process. And so this is how my days currently line up in what I would call a normal week, which I explained a couple weeks back, pretty much means I'm not traveling. So I'm here at the office, at the house every single day. Uh, So Mondays and Tuesdays, those are days where I don't necessarily need deep work for sermons. I just try to give myself a couple of hours a block uh, each day. Now, Monday sometimes just means like an hour, and what I do on on that Monday is I'm going to just read through the text a bunch, and that's when I'm going to make my questions. Um, I'm going to make a list maybe of words to go do deeper word study for, uh, just bigger things that have at play, and I'm going to fill out my sermon worksheet then. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more in the episode, but I'm going to fill out my sermon worksheet then. And then if I'm done and my mind is still good and I still have time to dedicate, I'll go ahead to the next week and do the same thing because that's what I've learned. There are certain things I can do far and ahead in advance in reading the text, asking a bunch of questions, making a list of words to do word study about, and filling out my sermon worksheet are things that I can absolutely do and have sitting for you know three, four weeks, sometimes six weeks, and come back to it and pick up. And, and I'll, I'm, I'm 90% there. I can, I can jumpstart that again. Now, on Tuesdays, I'll try to give Tuesdays a couple of hours of work, and it's focus work. Like I said, it's not context switching, but uh, give it a couple of hours. And so sometimes I'll do that in the afternoon. If I don't have coaching calls in the afternoon, I'll do it in the afternoon so I can take advantage of that Tuesday morning time when it's absolutely my green zone, my developing time, like my brain is at its best then. And so I'll try to give myself a deep work block on Tuesday, but I won't give it to sermon preparation because I can do this because all I do on Tuesday is I answer my questions. I go into Accordance Bible, I do my uh, word study, um, I answer the questions, and then um, I will go into commentaries after that. And if it's a, a quick week, if I'm really, really hampered on time, I'm going to go into a couple of commentaries to answer questions. That's it. I'm not going to be just reading uh, you know, from page 217 to 222 because that's the five pages that are on the text I'm preaching. I go in in hot, answer the questions. If I'm on a week where I've got a lot of discretionary time and I've got time that day, I might read a little bit further just to see you know what else might stick out. But that's what Tuesdays are for. Um, I try to get all my research done, that sort of thing. So what that means is when I kind of wrap up sermon preparation time on Tuesday, uh, that means I have uh, the only thing I have left to do is my you know outlining and communication design actually writing the message. And that's where I give to deep work. I give myself a solid two and a half, three hours on Wednesday. I defend that time like crazy because that is when I need to just sitting there and be at my best. I need to have access to my whiteboard. I need to make sure my notes are all there and I'm going to go back and forth a bunch and do a bunch of things because I'm, that's when I'm designing my sermon at that point in time, I'm designing to preach this thing from the stuff that I've just communicated. 
And then Thursday, uh, you know, sometimes Thursday mornings uh, can be a struggle because it's the end of the work week for me. It's been busy. Um, I'm going to write my manuscript then. But at that point in time, I've probably outlined this thing several times, more than that, a little bit. Um, but this is going to be easy because all I'm doing is, hey, Chad, write this down. And what I've learned is I can typically write my manuscript in a 25-minute Pomodoro uh, rhythm. And so I'll get to it pretty early on Thursday morning because that's when my brain will be absolutely at its best because by Thursday afternoon, my brain is trash at that end of the week. And, and so I, that's why I do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then I run through my message on Saturday. Uh, there have been different times in my life where I would run through it three or four or five times on Saturday, but I'm in a time of my life where I, I don't feel the need to do that. Uh, but that's what that's what matters to me. And, and like I said, I, I, I need one solid block of deep work time. Now, in a week where everything is crazy, I'm going to talk about that some, uh, I've learned some strategies to be able to deal with this. So like uh, the, the, the biggest one is try to work ahead a little bit. Never sit down to an absolute blank page before you go into it. But really the the biggest next movement is this, uh, and especially in prepping to preach, always be outlining. That's my thing. I'm always outlining. If you've seen the way I mark up my Bible with my color code and that sort of a thing, that actually came from me annotating my sermon preparation notes back when I did that entirely on paper. And it's, come, it's carried over into good notes with me, even though I've been in good notes for years now. I got two colors that are get marked up in my my handwritten notes constantly, and it's orange and yellow. Orange means to include, include this in the sermon. Yellow means these are my thoughts. So sometimes if I'm reading somebody else's thing, or I'm reading a commentary, or reading an article, that sort of thing, and I'm taking notes on that, I will come up with some things and places that matter a lot that are outside of the scope of what I read. And so I'll still do those, but then I'll mark those in yellow just so I know. And this is the thing. I've got this simple grid because, you know, you also, your preaching outline and your typical method of preaching, the way that you design your communication. For me, it's always in four movements. And for the longest time, what I used to do was uh, when I was just preaching from a a handwritten bullet point notes, um, I would just draw lines on the paper, uh, sheet down an eight and a half by 11 paper and just have four columns. Um, now I'm, I'm doing manuscript thing and it's three pages. Like I know three pages of manuscript notes is exactly what I, I need to go into my current church, but I think it's got this grid. I make up a, a four part grid on uh, a piece of paper is what I used to do handwritten. Now I have a, a, a digital template that I use in good notes for this that just shows the four movements of the sermon. Like I like to, and so I'm just always outlining, like I literally start outlining typically on Monday. And because I have this template in good notes, I can drag it in. I will sometimes have five to six to seven iterations of an outline of my sermon before I get to my final outline. And the great thing about that is I told you I mark things that to include in orange. I know I've got grid one, grid two, grid three, and grid four. So I'll mark something in orange and I'll write the number on there. Hey, this belongs in grid three. And the more clarity I get, then you'll start to see things turn into 3A, 3B, 3C, that sort of a thing. And so as I'm reading, I'm thinking through the outline of my head, I'm writing things down, and then I'm going off and just kind of slowly building off these outlines, these outlines, these outlines. I'm always thinking towards how am I going to teach this? How am I going to include this? You know, I'm thinking about that outline. I'll also use, so Nancy Duarte has a book called Resonate, and it was about creating TED Talks, like that sort of a thing. But it's also about about storytelling and presentations. It's amazing. But she has this little thing. I call it the stair step. And you can get her book for free. Just Google Nancy Duarte Resonate. And it has this really cool interactive version online. But the stair step is just this idea of what is and what could be. And that has helped me work through tough transitions for ages. And so I've got another little template that I have a PDF that gets dragged into good notes that helps me think through those transitions. And a lot of times what it is, is, you know, I might have five to seven to eight bullet point notes on something. And I use that stair step to help me order those together and to think through like, what is it I'm asking someone to do or to change or to grow that sort of a thing. So I've got my, my grid outline and I've got the stair step outlines And I'm using multiple of those. And a lot of times, if I know that I need to think through something in an outline in my next iteration, 
I'll just do a quick drawing of this stair step and circle it so I know, hey, when I come back to this next time, I need to think through this a little bit. And then, and then I have my sermon worksheet. Now, I'm using this thing from very day one, but this is kind of where I wanted to talk about in this podcast. You know, my sermon worksheet helps me set the big parameters of what my sermon is. It's the text, it's the title, uh, it's the what is this about I have a space for my Monday moment in there, just this this teaching device that I use to help people understand and remember the sermon. Uh, and then I always, it, then after that, there's the sermon work sheet is always changing. It's always helping me think through what I'm trying to focus on. Right now, my sermon sheet has a lot of stuff about response. It has a lot of stuff about application because those are the things I'm working on focusing on. So my sermon worksheet is also always keeping me in line it's always helped me remember this is what I am preaching on. So if I'm going to something and it's outside of the boundaries of that sheet, I don't spend time thinking about it. So all these little extra tools I've developed for myself over the years help me to prep to preach, specifically the sermon. And then the last thing is this. It's about planning ahead. You see, that, that worksheet I have and then just a handful of basic reflections um, I normally just copy paste the scripture passage out of uh, the Uversion app and then drop it into Good Notes. Normally, having the worksheet and having that scripture uh, copy pasted there for the space for me to ask questions, uh, make notes of stuff of word study, that sorts of things. That's enough to let me get ahead, and I can come back to it. You know, all I really need if I have that those two things is a two or three hour block of deep work because I can do the rest of the research scattered across a week. If things get wild, I can always have a commentary with me and steal 20 minutes to read through that, to answer questions. I have um, both my, uh, a copy of accordance and a copy of logos on my iPad. So I can always steal 15, 20, 30 minutes there for reparation. I don't advocate context switching, but if you're in a week where everything goes absolutely squirrely, You'll have to learn how to do it. And for me, the one thing I have to defend is that block of deep work time. And if I can't do it, if something happens on Wednesday morning and I can't do it, I will absolutely try to decide when is the next best time for me to do this. And if that means adding it to Thursday morning, I will. But that means then if I can do anything I can on Wednesday evening to decompress, to relax, to try to sleep well so I can leverage as, as my brain to be at its best and as healthy as, as can be on a Thursday morning, I will do it for that. If I have more time on my hands, uh, I will work ahead. Um, if I have more time on my hands, I'll use that to outline things out. If I'm doing a sermon series where I want to go really, really, uh, be really, really focused on the design of the whole series, I'll spend some time thinking through that. Um, I will spend some more time refining my communication design. I've learned from me having more time on my week is not spent best in research and commentary and reading, but it is spent on design, either at the front end of a sermon or a sermon series or the back end of it, and to think through that. And so that's the ways that I prep to preach. That's the ways that, you know, the last few years, especially being bivocational now, I need six and a half hours a week. Like six and a half hours a week, I can I can do what I would call to be a good sermon as far as that's concerned. So I wanted this episode because I told you it's the end of the year. We're wrapping that kind of stuff up. I want to talk about some big level planning, some big kind of conversations like that. But also I got some Twitter DMs from people saying, hey, explain to me how it seems that you're not devoting the time that I have to devote to sermon preparation. That's what it is. It's prepping to preach. And you know, it's really been in the last five years since I have understood this and I found the power of it. So just think through that. Just think through what is your preparation rhythm? You know, what is the what are the, the, the parts of your sermon? How is that ordered and flow? And then also, how can you maybe schedule those things across your week according to your, your time, according to your energies, according to what's possible? But that's it. It's been 30 minutes, y'all. I thought this was going to be a quick episode, and I'm looking down right now and realizing, no, this is a long episode. But thanks so much for sticking in. Thanks for hanging around. Come party with us over in the Productive Pastor Community on Facebook. There'll be a link to that in the show notes. The Productivity Party, over a 1,000 pastors are in there. Talking about what does it mean to do this ministry thing in a way that's healthy, effective, 
and productive. We'd love to see you in there. So until next episode, I'm Chad. Remember, not having one next week, taking Thanksgiving off. But I will see you back in December as we kind of launch off across some big picture conversations for the rest of the year. And I will see you then.